Okay, so in the last class, we were looking at the question of how do you choose the sizes of the transistors in more complex gates such as for example an AND gate or an AND or invert or some other more complex gate. Okay. So as an example, we looked at what an AND2 gate looks like. NAND2 is a two input NAND gate. It basically means the equation is y is equal to a dot b, the whole bar, where a and b are the inputs. So what we saw was there are two parts to the structure of this gate, the pull-up and pull-down network respectively. Okay. So the pull-down network in this case looks something like this, two NMOS transistors in series. The pull-up network will look like two PMOS transistors in parallel. <coughs> And the same signal A and B respectively are connected to the NMOS as well as the PMOS. So the signal A is connected to two transistors, one is the NMOS, the other is the PMOS. The signal B is also connected to two transistors, one is NMOS, one is PMOS. Okay, so there is no A bar or anything else over here, it is A itself which is connected in both cases. Alright, so the next thing that we saw was, and of course the output is taken as the meeting point between the pull-up and pull-down network. Now the next question that arises is what should be the sizes of the transistor? Okay. Now I want to make a couple of things clear which may not have been very clear because there were a few questions about it after class. The first is there is no hard and fast rule saying this is the only way to choose the sizes of transistors. What I propose saying that you know we will make the pull-up and pull-down resistances equal is one way of doing it. Okay? You could potentially have chosen some other method that would have given you some other properties for the NAND gate. It would still have behaved as a NAND gate because when the terminal conditions, when the inputs are at 0 and 1 respectively, this circuit is guaranteed to behave like a NAND gate. Okay? So if that is the case, then <coughs> keep that in mind. The choice of sizes of transistors is not unique. It is more or less based on a convention. In our case, the convention that we are going to do is to make the rise and fall resistances equal to each other. Okay? The second thing which may not have been very clear last time is I am not necessarily trying to make them make anything, the rise time or fall time or anything of that sort, equal to that of the inverter. Okay. In fact, as we will see soon, the delay through this land gate will not be the same, same as the delay through an inverter. Okay. What we are trying to do is first of all make it equal to each other and secondly to make it equal to that of the reference inverter just as a starting point. From there everything can be scaled up. Even a reference inverter where you have the minimum size NMOS and 2x size PMOS, right? is this one possible configuration of the inverter. You can scale both the transistors, that is make both of them 10 times as big as they are and it behave exactly the same. Okay. So with all of that in mind, how should you choose the sizes of the transistors? What we said was, we want the pull down resistance to be equal to R. For that there are two transistors in series. How do you make the total resistance be equal to R? Make each one equal to R by T. Okay? How do you get the resistance of an NMOS transistor to be R by 2? Choose its width to be double the width of an NMOS which has a resistance R. Okay? So that is how we came up with the sizes 2 and 2 respectively. In the case of the PMOS, in the worst case, either A or B alone is going to be on and we will have to take up the job of pulling the output all the way up to VT. In the best case, both of them turn on at the same time, okay, and are going to be pulling the output up. But if that is not the case, then we have to make do with any one of them alone, okay. 
and even under those conditions we want the resistance to be at most R. So how do I get the PMOS resistance to be R? As in the case of the inverter I choose the width of the PMOS to be 2. Once again, what does this 2 indicate over here? It is not 2 lambda. It is 2 times the minimum size inverter. Okay? But again, this is a convention that I am following over here. It's not that this is the only way of representing transistors. In different textbooks, you may find that the weights are given directly in terms of micron or they are given in terms of lambda. Right? The convention I am following is that the number that is specified next to the inverter indicates how many times of a minimum unit sized inverter. It is. What is a unit sized inverter? 4 lambda by 2 lambda. Okay. Alright. Now, what this will give us is a NAND gate which has pull up resistance equal to R, pull down resistance equal to R and otherwise behaves like a NAND gate, right, in the sense that Y is equal to A dot B the whole power is equation realized by it. The next question that comes up essentially is, okay, so what would be the delay through this gate, right? So I have some load capacitance, CL, and I want to know what will be the right delay and the fall delay that happens through this gate. In this case, I know that the right delay and fall delay, I can expect them to be about equal. Why? Because I know that the right resistance and the fall resistance, I have made them equal. Okay? In reality, there is another sort of subtle point over there that we have to consider, but we will get to that later. Okay. For the time being, we can sort of expect that the right resistance and fall resistance being equal, the right delay and fall delay should also be equal. Okay? So now, what is the delay going to be? How much is it? How much is the delay through this gate going to be? Huh? Somebody say it loudly. R into CL. Anything else? There should be a parasitic component. Right? So it is going to be R into CL. That much is the delay corresponding to the external load. There is also some other additional delay due to the parasitic component of the capacitor. I just call that the parasitic form of. So let's try and estimate what the parasitic capacitance is going to be. Right? This parasitic capacitance is effectively what is the total capacitance seen at this point? Okay? So how much is it going to be? What are all the things that are contributing to a capacitance at this point? There are two PMOS transistors, and it is always going to be the drain diffusion capacitance, right? That much is clear, because the parasitic essentially refers to the drain diffusion capacitance. The external load, whatever it is, is the gate capacitance of some other transistor, that's fine. But what is happening at this point, the parasitic, is going to be the drain diffusion of some transistors. Which transistors is the test? So, one PMOS, another PMOS, one n mos. Okay? The second n mos is separated from this point over here by another transistor. Okay? In reality, what that means is we have to consider it as an extra load because 
now that that capacitance in other words there is some capacitance at this point also right which i do need to consider but for the time being i am going to ignore it okay because considering that slightly complicates the computation and the effect of that anyway is going to be slightly less because it is farther away from this point that i am trying to charge your data okay so for the time being i am going to just neglect that particular capacitance and try and estimate the capacitance due to all the other three transistors okay now what information do you need in order to get the parasitic capacitances of those three transistors the size okay do we know the size yes we have already chosen the w value okay so now given the w values what are the capacitances due to those three transistors going to be like compared to the unit size transistor assuming that the unit mos transistor n mos or p mos that in matter has a drain diffusion capacitance of p what is the total capacitance due to each of these going to be 2t from the n mos 2t from the p mos 2t from the other p mos okay now this is once again an approximation the reason for that is how many of you have already attempted the layout experiment okay so you would have seen what the sizes those of you who have who have done it hopefully would have seen what the size of the n mos and p mos look like when you actually draw them in a magic layer right so if you have not please make sure you do that assignment before the end of this week it will be at least useful for you to get an idea of what layout looks like right although it is not directly connected with the quiz coming up next week that assignment that carry marks so please make sure you do all the assignment okay when you try to do a layout for a slightly more complex gate like a nand gate you will find that you don't really create one pmos another pmos link them up with a wire no that's not how you do it what you will find is there is going to be some kind of an overall structure what does a single nmos for example look like you will create the this will be the poly and this will be the n plus n diffusion right so this is one nmos transistor supposing i want to make two nmos transistors in series one after the other how will i create them in i want and one possibility is to do this put a contact over here put a contact over here and put a metal wire joint this is one possibility but a much more likely scenario is to use this instead so what have i done over here in the second case i have shared the diffusion region between source of one transistor and drain of another transistor okay so the total area occupied by it is not equal to the sum of the areas of individual drain and source it is much less than that okay so for example when you have transistors in theory you will not necessarily want to add up the areas of each one of them okay the problem is we are not doing the full layout and extracting the capacitances from that we are trying to do hand calculations over here we want to do a quick and dirty estimate right just get an idea of how much is the capacitance so we know roughly what the parasitic is going to be like even if it's off by a significant factor it doesn't matter we can take that into account later all right so with that in mind what we say it doesn't matter that the layout itself actually can influence the parasitic capacitance quite a bit as a first step 
first order approximation. I am going to assume that the three transistors present at this point are independent transistors. So one NMOS and two TMOS are independent of each other and are each contributing two C worth of capacitor. Okay? So that the C parasitic becomes equal to six times C, where C is the capacitance of a unit transistor. Okay? Alright, so now let's rewrite that delay equation. Right? Now, what is this R? It is the resistance of a single unit NMOS transistor. It doesn't matter whether that transistor was used for making a NAND gate or an inverter or an OR gate or an XOR gate. Right? It is the resistance of a single unit NMOS transistor. What is the C? It is a capacitance, the brain diffusion capacitance or equivalently also the gate capacitance because we know that they are pretty much equal of once again a single unit transistor in this case. It doesn't matter whether it's thermos or thermos. Okay. Which means that we can try and rewrite this particular equation in terms of that constant that we had for the inverter. Right? 3 R C. Right? Remember what we said about this 3 R C being a technology constant? It is something that you can measure for the particular technology. It only depends on the sizes and the characteristics of the minimum size or of the unit transistor. So if I get a 3RC into CN divided by 3C plus 2. Okay? Now, this CL divided by 3C is reminding me of what I had for the case of the inverter, right? I took the load capacitance divided by the capacitance of the inverter itself so that I know how many times the load is compared to the gate. If I want to do that for the NAND gate, it is slightly different because what is the input capacitance of the NAND gate? Let's go back to the Schematic. What is the total input capacitance seen at terminal A? Four. Right? Why? Because there are two transistors, each of size two. So the input capacitance at terminal A is equal to four C. Same way, input capacitance at terminal B is also equal to four C. Okay. So unlike the inverter where it was a PMOS of size 2 and an NMOS of size 1 that was the input, for an AND gate it is PMOS of size 2 and NMOS of size 2. Okay. So the total input capacitance seen by any signal which is connecting to the NAND gate is 4C. Right? Based on that I would like to rewrite this equation so that I can write my first term within bracket as something which is a proportion. How big is my load compared to my gate itself? Okay, so I will rewrite it like this. Cl by 4G this is how big is the load compared to cell into 4 by 3 plus 2. This term Cl by 4C we call the electrical effort. Okay? Why electrical effort? Because in some sense it is a measure of 
how much extra work you are doing how big is the load that you are trying to try compared to your test the gate itself is a large gate then driving a large load is not a big difficulty but if the gate is a small gate driving a large load is going to be difficult because it can deliver only a small current So the CL divided by 4C is a very important measure. It essentially tells you how big is your load compared to yourself. Okay. That we call as the electrical effort. The other two terms that we have over here, this 4 by 3. Now, where did the 4 by 3 come from? It came about because of the relative sizes of the transistors and the capacitance of the input. Right? which means it is a property of what kind of sizes we chose for the transistors why did we choose those sizes because we wanted to have equal rise and fall resistances why did those numbers come out the way that we had because of the way that the transistors are connected together in other words because it was a two input nand case okay so the number 4 by 3 came about because it was a two input nand case it is purely a property of the nand gate itself it has nothing to do with any other technology parameter it is just the schematic the structure of the nand gate itself determines the number 4 by 3 we call this number as a logical effort It's a measure of how difficult or easy it is for a given gate to drive a certain load. Larger the value of this number, the more difficult it is for a gate to drive a load. Why more difficult? Because if this number is larger, the delay is increased. Right? So a larger value for the logical effort means that for a given load compared to yourself, the delay is going to be larger. This means that this particular gate is finding it harder to drive a certain load. Okay. The final term over here is, for obvious reasons, called the parasitic effort. This is easy to understand. It is a parasitic load. We are normalizing it again. The three R C term. So it becomes a parasitic effort. The interesting thing is this is also now purely a property of the nand gate. It no longer depends on R or C or any other technology parameter. It's a property purely of the structure. Okay. So these two terms. The logical effort equal to 4 by 3 and parasitic effort equal to 2 are properties of the nand gate. Okay, of the schematic itself, of the structure of the nand gate. It has nothing to do with the technology that is used. If you scale the technology, this property will still be satisfied. The only thing that can change this. If, if let's say you have a technology in which the BMOS transistor conductivity is one third of the N MOS instead of half, right? Then what would happen? You would have to choose your BMOS to be three times of the N MOS for getting equal rise and fall resistance. That means in turn it will affect your input capacitance, it will affect your equal equivalent resistances, all of those factors, right? So the technology does have an impact on this logical effort computation, but it's a secondary effect. Okay. The interesting thing is the most important part over here is you can compute this V equal to four by three and V equal to two just by looking at the schematic without having to know anything else about the transistor. Okay. Let's repeat this for a NOR gate. So what does the two input NOR gate look like? First thing, what is the equation? A plus B the whole bar. Okay. 
సో వాటర్ దట్ నేను ఇంకా అంత ప్రూఫ్ లేదు ఇఫ్ ఎనీ వన్ ఆఫ్ ఏ ఆర్ బి ఇస్ ఈక్వల్ టు వన్ దౌట్పుట్ మన బి ఈక్వల్ టు జీరో ఇఫ్ ఏ అండ్ బి ఆర్ బోత్ జీరో దెన్ దౌట్పుట్ ఇస్ వన్ what does the schematic look like the transistor connection what does the pull up network what does the pull down network look like for this two parallel and not parallel and what does the pull up network look like see what about the sizes of the transistor let's look at the pull down network first what is the worst case any one of the two transistors is on and has to pull down the output okay so under those conditions what should its size be one right so that it exactly equivalent it has the same resistance as the nmos transistor used in the reference inverter okay so this is our size 1 this is also our size 1 what about the p mod they should be our size 4 and 4 because they must have resistance r by 2 and r by 2 right if it has size 2 the p mod has a resistance of r so to make it r by 2 it must have a size of 4 right from this now the next question is what is the total parasitic load for this going to be like it's going to be 4 from this 1 from this 1 from this so 6 right and what is the other part of it the logical effort going to be how do we do this once again we are interested in writing down how big is the load compared to the transistor and the transistor used in the input stage itself okay so the simple way of doing that is actually to sort of say what is the total input capacity seen by this particular a versus what is that seen by the reference inverter take the ratio of those two 5c for this one right because a is connected to 4c plus c b is also connected to 4c plus c so the total input capacitance is 5c for the reference inverter it was 3c the ratio between those two is going to be the logical effort right another way of writing it of course is to say outright b is equal to r into cl plus 6c this is equal to 3rc into cl by something 3c sorry not 3c just yeah cl by uh, something into 3c okay but the input has to be 5 so into 5 by 3 Okay. Here by 5C is the electrical effort. So B is equal to 3RC into 5 by 3 times, I'll call the electrical effort S plus logical, parasitic effort of C.
Okay? So now you sort of get the idea how just by inspection you can in principle write out the logical effort for any arbitrary case. Right? Let's complicate this a little bit. What does the pull up and pull down look like? Pull down is A in series with B or C. Pull up is going to have A in parallel with B and C in series. What are the sizes of the transistors going to be? For the pull down, I want the A to be R by 2, B and C individually to be R by 2. So, 2, 2, 2. For the pull up, one possibility is that A alone has to pull everything up. So, it must have resistance R. So, for that it must have size 2. The other possibility is B and C together have to pull the output up. Okay? So they must have R by 2 and R by 2. 4 for the cycle. Okay? Which means that one thing I can straight away say is the C parasitic. I can just add up the capacitances at that point. Right? Remember I said there are some additional capacitances from midway between B and C on the pull-up for example or midway between A and the B C combination on the pull-up. Okay? Those are secondary effects, we will talk about them later. Okay? For the time being we are ignoring them. So the C parasitic is total capacitance at this point it is 2 from here, 4 from here and 2 from here. So, AC. Okay. What about the logical effort? The logical effort is actually different over here for whether, depending on whether you are considering an input A or input B and C. Right? B and C have the same value of logical effort, but that is different from the logical effort for A. Right? Now, one way you can write this is B is always equal to R into CL plus A times C. This doesn't change. Right? If I consider A as the input, what is the total capacitance of the input of A? 2 plus 2, right? So 4 plus 8 by 2. But this is also equal to, if I consider B or C, what is the total input capacitance at B? It is 6 times 6, right? Because the PMOS has capacitance of 4. So, in other words, for this one, GA is equal to 4 by 3, GB is equal to GC is equal to 2. 6 by 3. The parasitic always remains the same. 8 by 3. Instead of writing out this equation in this way, I could also very well have just looked at the input capacitance. Right? What is the total input capacitance on A? 4 units. Therefore, 4 divided by the reference inverter 3. What is the input capacitance on B? 
six units divided by that for the reference in order three. So logical effort for B or C is equal to two. Okay. Now let's just see one step further. How this sort of helps us when we are trying to do the computation of delay through some slightly complex chain of logic. Let's say that I have a circuit which looks something like this. And I'm going to say that the input capacitance at this point, that is to say, the size of that gate, is five femtocarat. Okay? I'm just telling you that the input capacitance is five femtocarat. I'm not telling you the sizes of the transistors. I'm not telling you how big the inverter is. I'm not telling you what scaling factor I've used. I'm telling you that the input capacitance is five femtocarat. Okay? Looking into that inverter. The capacitance at that point is five femtocarat. This is not the parasitic due to anything else. This is the input capacitance of that inverter. Okay. Same way. At this point, it is twenty. Right. Once again, just a matter of the NAND gate. It has nothing to do with the parasitic of the inverter in this case. That is separate. The twenty femtocarat is the input capacitance. Of that NAND gate. Okay. This one here is 50 femtocarat, and the final load to be driven is 100 femtocarat. I am just making up these numbers, but just to illustrate a point. Okay. I give you only this much information. And ask you to calculate the delay through this chain of logic. How are you going to do it? First of all, what is the delay through the entire chain going to be? Sum of the delay through the user phase. Okay, right. What's the delay through the first phase? What are the things that I need to know? Logical effort, electrical effort, parasitic effort. Right. So it is three R C multiplied by that equation, G into X plus C. The three R C is a technology constant. I'm in fact going to just leave that out for now. The three R C we know is approximately 15 picoseconds for 180 nanometer technology for the 180 nanometer that we are working with. So we just take that as a given and leave it aside. Okay, we multiply everything by three R C. I just want delays in terms of three R C. Right. So for the first stage, I need to know the logical effort, the electrical effort, and the parasitic effort. What is the logical effort of an inverter? What? It depends only on the fact that it is an inverter. It doesn't depend on how big it is. The fact that the input capacitance was five femtocarads, or whether it was point five femtocarads or two femtocarads, I don't care. It's an inverter. It has T MOS, which is twice the size of the N MOS. End of story. Okay. It's just a property of the structure. Logical effort of the inverter is one. What is the parasitic effort? Also one. You remember the equation that we had? It was one plus something for the inverter. So the two input NAND gate. What is it? What is the logical effort? Four by three. And the parasitic effort. Two. We just calculated, right? And for the two input NOR gate, what is it? Again, we just calculated it. G is equal to five by three. C is equal to two. 
So the total delay is equal to D1 plus D2 plus D3. This is equal to G1 into X1 plus C1 plus G2 X2 plus C2 plus G3 X3 plus C2. Multiply by 3 RC, which I am just ignoring for now. Okay. What is X1? Twenty by five, right? Remember, it is how big your load is compared to yourself. Only the immediate load. The fact that further down the line I am driving hundred cents of harness, I don't care. The inverter is only driving a nine gate. The nine gate is driving a nor gate. The nor gate is driving a big capacitor. Okay. So as far as the inverter is concerned, it is seeing only the nine gate. What is the electrical effort it sees? Twenty cents of harness divided by its own size is 5 cents of value. That's it. By taking the ratio 20 divided by 5, I no longer need to worry about whether this is a minimum size inverter or a scaled inverter or some other size. Right? Obviously, this is a scaled inverter because the minimum size inverter will not have a capacitance of 5 cents of value. But I don't need to worry about how much is the scaling. Right? So 1 into 20 by 4, so 20 by 5, plus 1. For the NAND case, 4 by 3 into 50 by 20 plus 2. And for the NOR case, 5 by 3 into 100 by 50 one second plus 2. Right? So you can calculate this. This is approximately what is it? 4 plus 1, 5 plus 10 by 3, 3.3 3 plus 5.3. Plus, I get 5.6. 15.6 multiplied by 15 per second. Okay. So the total delay to that chain is approximately going to be around 230 per second or somewhere around that. What did I need for doing this calculation? Nothing. That's the relative relative sizes of the gate. I wanted to know how big the next gate is compared to the present state. Right? That's the beauty of this entire thing. It takes into account the fact that any scaling of the gate that you do will deliver larger current but will also result in higher parasitic capacitance. So the parasitic delay will remain the same. The electrical effort and hence the logical part of the delay will change depending on how big your load is compared to your test. Okay? So without needing to know the exact sizes of the transistors that are used in each of these case, I can form an estimate straight away of the total delay through this entire thing in picoseconds. Okay. All right. So we'll go through one more big example of this probably in tomorrow's class, right? Because I want to make sure that this idea, the basic idea of how you use this logical effort to do quick computation, is clear to everyone, right? But please do think about it. You need to be clear about what exactly is happening over here. Why? we are allowed to do these kind of computations and how we are able to get all the estimates of delay without having to worry about the actual size of the transistor.
Now, one thing that you might find in practice is, for example, different vendors. I mean, not everybody follows the method of logical effort for specifying the name. Okay? So, there are other ways as well of specifying the delay. One particular method which is quite popular is to just say the delay is equal to intrinsic delay plus resistance into capacitance. Okay. In fact, this is usually split up further and say that rise delay equal to intrinsic rise delay plus rise resistance into load capacitance and in turn the fault delay is also similarly defined. So this is in fact pretty much just going back to our original equation, right? D is equal to R into CL plus what we are saying is this DT. Right? In other words, the only change that has been made over here from the original equation is instead of writing the R into C parasitic, we are taking R into C parasitic as a constant and calling that the property of the gate. Okay. Now, you will find that this method of specifying delay is actually quite popular and is the method that is used, for example, in the basic timing models in something like synopsis design compiling. Okay. Synopsis is one of the big giants of the design automation world. They made their tool called design compiler is one of the tools which is used for synthesizing hardware. Right. You write out the hardware description language whatever you have and design compiler takes care of converting that into J for you. It is almost like an industry standard at this point, it is one of the most popular tools. They use this format for specifying delay. They don't use logical error. Okay? Now fundamentally you can realize that the two are equal because both came out of this equation. Right? Logical effort is better suited for hand calculation. In the case of design compiler, what they decided was, we are not doing hand calculation. The approximations that are being made for logical effort are maybe a little bit more than is acceptable for the kind of computations that we need. So instead for every gate, let us put the complete rise and fall resistance. Okay? And you just use that for computing your delay. So that for example, the rise and fall resistance, the way that it works is, supposing I design a NAND gate, I do the layout, I extract the equivalent pulse deck, I do a simulation and find out what is the equivalent rise resistance, equivalent fall resistance. Supposing I have a different inverter, right? let's say this was for an inverter. Let's say I have a different inverter of size, larger size. Right? I want to make the NMOS and the PMOS both bigger. Why would I do that? So that it can deliver larger current. Okay, and can be used better for driving large loads. Instead of just saying, oh yeah, you look, the logical effort remains the same, now you just need to calculate electrical efforts properly. What synopsis does is, it straight away characterizes that entire circuit. And says, okay, for the new inverter, this is the right resistance, this is the false resistance, this is the parasitic case the intrinsic gate. Okay? By giving all three of those parameters, you just take care of the delay calculations that they do. As far as the computer is concerned, it doesn't need to simplify. It can just do the computations outright. So both methods are equally valid, are equally accurate provided that you have the right numbers. Okay? And can be used interchangeably for doing your computation. Okay. All right, I'll stop here for today's class. Tomorrow we'll continue with one more example of logical effort before moving on to other topics. Please.